Dr. Boring from the Cloudy and Rayleigh in Copenhagen. Welcome to the last e-training session, Enhancing Energy Efficiency in East Africa, hosted by the Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency. My name is Aris. I'm working as a program officer at the Copenhagen Center, and I will be the moderator for today's e-training. A couple of things before we move to the main content of our e-training. This e-training is going to be about 110 minutes long, including time for Q&A at the end. In case you cannot stay until the end or want to get back to our presentations, all the materials and recording of the whole e-training will be available online in a few days on the Copenhagen Center's Knowledge Management System. And we have many other webinar and information over there. Just have a look. Now, before we start discussing about today's e-training, I would like to inform our attendees uh, one more time that we comply with the General Data Protection Act, also known as GDPR. This means that your personal data, such as name, email, workplace, etc., is safely processed and stored, and all of your rights pursuant to the GDPR are respected. You have full access to the data being processed about you, and at any time, you can request that inaccurate data be deleted or rectified. For access or further information, please contact with the people that are presented here. A few things about the Copenhagen Center. The center conducts research and advisory activities in the field of energy efficiency and serves as energy efficiency hub for sustainable energy for all initiative. The center has an established network of global, regional, and national partners with a broad range of stakeholders to help accelerate the implementation of energy efficiency activities. Now, I would like to briefly introduce the speakers of today's e-training. Uh, we will start with uh, Fernando. Fernando is working as a senior advisor with the UNEP PTU partnership, and he's a chemical engineer with more than 20 years of work experience on climate change policy and atmospheric pollution. Then we will go to Morris. Morris is the project lead of, for the Rwanda Cooling Initiative, a joint program of Rwanda Environment Management Authority and UNEP's Unite for Efficiency that uh, supported the government of Rwanda in developing and implementing the national cooling strategy aimed at promoting clean and efficient cooling. And at the end, we're going to have Agustin. Agustin is working as corporate carbon footprint analysis at the Argentine Network of Municipalities Against Climate Change, and he's an environmental engineer student. Finally, I would like to inform that you can send us your questions during the presentations using the dedicated icon, and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can at the end. Please do not forget to mention the name of the panelist that the question is for. And now, uh, I would like to give uh, the floor to the next speaker, who is going to be Fernando. So, Fernando, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much, Aris. Very glad to be a uh, part of uh, this uh, uh, training. I'm from Chile. Uh, I'm an in charge of presenting you this module five of measurement, reporting, and verification systems. I have only 20 minutes, so I'll try to be uh, as fast as I can. Talking about uh, uh, MRV, when we are talking of MRV, we are talking of three components that work together uh, as a system. Uh, we are talking of, of a measurement component followed by a reporting component that is useful to inform what has been the, the results of the measuring process. Uh, and this information needs to be uh, reported, usually to uh, uh, authorities. And finally, a verification component. That means that the evaluation of the information presented is uh, assessed uh, externally in terms of completeness, coherence, and, and, and how re reliable is that. The important thing of verification is that it's done by a, a third party, not by the same, the same team that did the me measurement and the reporting. Now, how can we use an MRV system? Well, basically, what, what we are uh, looking for when we are uh, preparing an MRV system is to find a way to show in a transfer manner that the results of the implementation of uh, mitigation actions uh, or climate mitigation actions are occurring, are taking place, and that the impacts associated are uh, quantified uh, properly and then uh, reported. We are thinking on a an IMRB system like a part of a more integrated monitoring system in the 
short, in the medium, and in the long term, that can work uh, periodically in terms of uh, showing what are the results of a project, in this case of a municipal energy efficiency project. And finally, we can also think of an MRV system as a way to check and, and give feedback on, on how well or, or, or maybe not that well is progressing a project and to make a corrective decisions during the uh, realization of the project and not when the project has uh, already finished. In terms of applicability uh, of an MRV system to uh, energy efficiency mun municipal projects, in this regard, we are counting with a tool that uh, monitors in a special site and exact way the, the impact generated by the project. Uh, this information can be relevant for uh, stakeholders and what we want is to find a way that we can check that, that the, the performance of the project can be uh, assessed on time. Now, let's see in more detail each of the elements of a, a typical MRV system. Let's start with the measurement component. And basically, what we want to do is an evaluation of indicators. With this, uh, indicators, we can then identify what are the impact. Usually we are talking in this kind of project of savings of a different, uh, under different metrics. We may think of savings in terms of lower energy consumption at the municipality level or the mitigation of GAG emissions from a climate po uh, point of view or the economic costs we are uh, reducing by the, the use of a more uh, energy efficiency system uh, or, or, being, or, or, or rather additional uh, co-benefits. If we count with uh, numerical data to back up these uh, indicators, then we are in a position to uh, provide a, a solid uh, numerical basis to characterize the multiple benefits associated with uh, this type of uh, energy project. At, at the end of the day, what uh, we have is a plan for measurement, and the plan should tell us a variety of elements, such as what should we measure, who will do it, how the measurements will be taken. And we are then thinking that the MRV system can start gathering this information and can uh, start uh, storing this information. And with this information, then we can start to take some conclusions from the financial point of view, from the process point of view, or uh, uh, from the technical point of view to see how the, the project is evolving on time. Here uh, in this slide, I'm showing you some examples of uh, metrics uh, you are uh, already in previous presentation of uh, this training in previous day had the opportunity, for instance, to see financial metrics, which can be considered uh, complementary to the process metrics, uh, for instance. And uh, all of them are, are presented in summary uh, in here. Uh, what what I'm, I'm saying is that when we are thinking of the measurement part in an MRV system, we should try to use the most the, the more information we have available that can make sense to be stored and presented as a feedback of the how the project is uh, evolving. Now, how can we perform calculations? One option, but uh, not the only one, is considering a, a technical tool for measuring. We here in uh, uh, in the center are keen on using the what is called the Clean Development Mechanism Methodology Notebook, which is uh, basically uh, the, the CDM or the Clean Development Mechanism uh, Methodologies that include more than 100 types of uh, typologies of projects that I have been submitted in the last uh, 10 years to obtain carbon emission reductions under the CDM mechanism. The good, the good thing is that uh, even if we are not uh, trying to uh, get carbon emission reductions under the CDM, still the methodologies are very strong from the technical 
uh, point of view, and we can use them as a, as a good, a, a solid technical a, a point to uh, perform this uh, calculation. If we are moving into more specific uh, energy projects, then maybe the, this uh, CDM uh, methodology methodologies uh, maybe are not enough, and then we will, we will then should try to use something more uh, specific. But I think that the, uh, as a as a overall tool, as a framework tool, these uh, CDM methodologies uh, are are quite uh, powerful. As an example, I'm giving you some typologies of projects that uh, for some way or another are uh, into being more efficient into the use of uh, en energy, <clears throat> either a uh, water distribution of pumping system or uh, efficient lining or energy efficiency uh, under uh, project buildings. And for each of them, I'm presenting you what are the parameters that can be used to make a sound MRV system for uh, the specific project uh, at the municipality level. Now, if we are moving <clears throat> on the preparation of reports, we are thinking that with this report, we should get uh, uh, some points to address. Uh, firstly, I will say that that will serve as a description of the organization of how the information is presented in the report including uh, which, what are the sources of uh, information that are uh, considered, what is the institutional organization by, by which the, this information was uh, gathered, and which is the legal framework be, uh, that uh, allow this information to be collected uh, from the uh, initial sources. It is also good to report under this uh, reporting part a description of the technical approach. We we'll use it to obtain the information and related calculations. And lastly, a description of how the quality of the information uh, using the port was verified. I think that if we are reporting this information under our MRV system, then we are providing a, a solid uh, basis for characterizing properly how the, the project is uh, working basically in, in the terms of process, in the terms of climate, and in the and economic uh, terms. Lastly, into the description uh, of the uh, MRV system, we have the, the verification component. And uh, the verification component uh, is uh, generally carried out by uh, uh, at the national level, but it consists of uh, external reviews of the information obtained through the implementation, implementation of the mitigation measures. In general, an authority like a public institution in charge of uh, either performing the, the project or following the project can commend a, a, speci a, a special company that uh, can be an expert in terms of verification processes like uh, energy auditors with knowledge of MRV is a, is a good, uh, is a good uh, opportunity. And we may think also that uh, verification can serve as a technical feedback uh, between national uh, and local officials when we are uh, developing projects uh, at the national level. So as a, as a summary of the different elements of an MRV of a different measurement reporting and verification system, in the following two slides, I show you how it would look like an a MRV system for project that install a energy efficient road lining systems. First, you have the, the measurement part and, and the definition of what makes uh, uh, who is uh, collecting the information, how the information is collected, how often is collected, and if there are some additional observations. And the same in terms of report and in terms of verification. I'm coming to an end to my uh, presentation with uh, some conclusions. 
related with the use of a MRV systems. If we decide to uh, use uh, an MRV system for our project, uh, definitely we will enhance the robustness and highlight what are the savings the projects in terms of energy consumption, but also uh, very important in terms of mitigation of GAG emissions or reduction of CO2. Uh, as an aggregated value, it will also serve to identify uh, how a project is progressing and if there are problems and, and we have then the opportunity to take some corrective actions as a part of a continuous improvement process. And finally, uh, projects operating with uh, MRV support are expected to be uh, evaluated uh, on a regular basis and then uh, can improve in time through uh, adequate uh, monitoring. This is what I, I wanted to, to, to present you and leave some time for questions. So thanks, Fernando. This is the end of module five. So we're going to have a Q&A session for Fernando and his presentation. And uh, Fernando, we received a few questions for you. And the first one is the MRB system of uh, mitigation actions or policies currently existing in countries need to be reported to the UNFCCC? Okay, with regards to the uh, UNFCCC, definitely yes. As a part of the biennial update reports that uh, all countries that are signing the Climate Change uh, Convention they have produced what is called a biannual update report, a BUR. And under the BUR, one of the contents is that the, the country must present what are the MRV system they have either in general or uh, if they have some uh, specific MRV system for mitigation of a specific projects, they can also be uh, presented officially by the country to the uh, UNEF's, UNE, uh, United Nations Framework uh, Climate Change Convention. Thank you very much, Fernando. And we have another question for you. And the question is, what are some popular methodologies to include in an IMRV system to estimate mitigation of uh, uh, global house gas emissions? Okay, thank you for that question as well. Well, the methodologies, Probably the most uh, solid package of methodologies comes from the methodologies from the uh, CDM, from the Clean Development Mechanism. But uh, it is important to, to state that this is not the only source of uh, methodologies for measuring CO2. But also uh, we can use, for instance, equations if we are doing a mass balance, or uh, from the IPCC guidelines, we can also gather some equations that can be a good option if we are not willing uh, to get into the, the CDM methodologies that, as I said, are very solid in technical terms, but sometimes are a bit uh, complicated to use if we don't have the full data that these uh, CDM methodologies uh, request. I think that that is something that can re re uh, answer your question. Uh, Thank you very much, for, Fernando, for, for the responses. And uh, this is the question that we received until now from the audience. Now, uh, I would like to continue with the presentation because we're going to module six, which is also the final one. Hello, welcome to this presentation. My name is Maurice Kaitare. Um, I lead the project Rwanda Cooling Initiative, uh, a project of the United for Efficiency U4E and I'm based in Kigali, Rwanda. I'll be taking you through this presentation um, entitled Showcasing Good Experiences in Africa. And I'll be talking about cooling regulation scoping, country savings assessments, market transformation approach, regional projects in Africa, and then communications and outreach. Let's start with cooling regulation overview. The cooling regulation basically needs to be comprehensive. It needs to look at minimum energy performance standards of equipment to be able to determine which equipment should be allowed to be imported into the country and which equipment should not. 
the regulation also needs to look at the affordability of these equipment, how to make them more affordable. So we're talking about the financial mechanisms here. Also, the uh, regulation needs to look at identifications. How do you identify um, an energy efficient equipment? And, and in that case, we're talking about labeling system. It also needs to recognize and put in place a way to recycle, to dispose of, of the old equipment. And, and that's where we talk about recycling. Then it needs to talk about the product registration system. A system that allows products to be tracked and traced throughout their life after they've entered into a country. And finally, an awareness campaign and capacity building for policy implementers, for consumers, um, and for all the stakeholders involved in this. Awareness campaign is key. It's very important, it tells people to be able to choose even the most efficient equipment, uh, which is sometimes not, does not come to conscious for the consumers. And all of these are actually being done in response to the call from the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol, which looks at energy efficiency and environment protection. So let's start with um, a quick look at the country savings assessment. This was done by U4E. And as you can see, the assessment was done in 156 countries, looking at the, at the energy consumption of different products. You can see that by the year 2020, most of the um, energy consumption is actually being dominated by lighting. As time goes on, refrigeration will increase, but more than refrigeration, air conditioning will actually dominate the, uh, the energy consumption and energy savings. In future, as the globe continues to warm, there's more need for more cooling, and more cooling increases uh, global warming. So unless this is quickly checked, uh, th there will be need for more cooling and more heating and more cooling and, and more cooling increasing uh, warming. And uh, there's, there's a couple of um, assessments, reports that can be found in different languages by U4E. I've put down there uh, the hyperlink for you to be able to get some more information there. And again, uh, the savings of potential for air conditioners indicate that up to 560 terawatt hours and 189 terawatt hours will be saved so you can see the comparison between the room air conditioners and residential refrigerators here. The savings are indicated. Um, there's, there's, there's a huge potential for savings. Nearly half of the power that will need to be consumed by room air conditioners can actually be saved by the year 2040. And it goes to show different scenarios. If we do you know, business as usual, the energy consumption will go up to 121% for air conditioners and 71% for refrigerators. By putting minimum ambitious MEPS, we can save up to 77 and 20% uh, for air conditioners and uh, and refrigerators respectively and with the ambi ambitious uh, maps 
we can be able to save up to 39% uh, and 32%. Sorry, not, not save, consume uh, 39% versus 32% of the power by 2040. And you can also see the equivalent, the equivalent in the amount of money that will be saved, um, the equivalent in the amount of uh, CO2 emissions that will be saved, and the equivalent in, in the amount of power stations that will be saved by the 2040. I've also extracted a quick example of how the utility in Rwanda would, for example, be able to save compared to the need for, for investment if the country would, for example, be able to implement a financial mechanism that allows people to consume power to consume less power compared to what they would consume for example if they're buying energy efficient refrigerators compared to the old ones they, they had the company the company the utility would be would be losing some revenues because you know the amount of power consumed has reduced but ultimately they would be able to save more by the need to invest so they would not need to invest in a long term uh, disregard the second uh, the gray bars those are a factor when you actually when when the utility actually starts to make some money off uh, the, the 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 implementation of the program but even without the revenues in gray you, st you can still see that um, the need for investment, if they would continue as they're approaching today and not put in place energy efficiency as, as an incentive, then they would need to spend more money by investing to generate more power that will in the end be uh, destroyed and we're not looking at uh, the environment facts factors at this point. So the cooling strategy approach is basically looking at putting in place a regulation, but making sure that there is information um, and making sure that there are incentives. The regulation itself can do as much, information itself can do as much, incentives themselves can do as much. But if you combine the three, put in place maps, ensure there are labels and ensure there's awareness campaign, and then put in place a financing mechanism, that's a three-legged system that actually allows um, the, the ecosystem th to thrive and, um, and accelerate the market transformation. So uh, let's look at the minimum energy performance standards. Minimum energy performance standards uh, basically constrain inefficient energy consuming cooling equipment from making it to the market you know and this accelerates the um, the green economy vision for example for different countries in case in case of rwanda they have um they have um, a vision to become um a green economy and this is demonstrated in in many of the of the national uh, commitments, the NDCs, the HPMP, uh, the National Cooling Strategy, and, and many, many other uh, plans that the government has. So one of the ways to ensure this is to actually put in place minimum energy performance standards. And, uh, and, and what you see here is what the government of Rwanda has put in place. They have indicated the different power ratings and um, the smaller the equipment basically the higher the efficiency can be and so they've captured 
the level of efficiency in five categories a to e and each letter a indicates per each category of power rating how much efficiency is, is, is expected and then when we come to f that is where um, that is what is not allowed to come into the country and on the financial mechanism there's a couple of financial mechanisms that are possible but I'll speak about two that uh, the government of Rwanda has implemented. Um, one is called the on bill financing. And the on bill financing is basically a financial mechanism where the utility bill will agree to collect funds through the electricity meter, be able to pay back the bank that provided the loan to the client, the client to get uh, an efficient equipment. So the whole system revolves around the fact that someone, a client, is actually getting an efficient equipment. And that equip efficient equipment will ensure that his utility bill is lowered. This is especially targeting clients who already owned uh, a refrigerator or an air conditioner that is not efficient. But in some cases, this also goes to include new, new clients, to ensure that they are not buying inefficient equipment from the beginning. But for those that already had equipment, it's trying to be bill neutral. If someone was spending $30 a month, the idea is that the fridge was consuming a certain amount of that, say $20. And if you could get an equipment that would consume $10, then you're saving $10, which could go back to pay the bank and be able to buy you the equipment. So your bill remains as $30 for a certain period until you've paid off your loan and your bill now goes lower. That's one mechanism that, that is under development. The second one is called lease, cool lease. It's a leasing product where a commercial building that wants to install you know, one million worth of riff of air conditioning can be able to get a loan from the bank um, to basically lease the equipment. So the bank buys the equipment, owns it, and the 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 client, the consumer, basically leases it and pays per month. So that removes the need for for fear of the high of the high capital requirement and if that component of the capital requirement is removed the clients will be able to make better choices looking at the operational co cost and for sure the operational cost for efficient equipment will be uh, much lower than the operational cost of an inefficient equipment So we also talked about the product registration system. A product registration system is basically a tool for capturing key information on a product to underpin policies or programs. And it's, it provides a, a data resource. Um, it enables monitoring and verification. Uh, then it, it facilitates the, the market transformation. U4E has so far developed an open source software in a region, in the region, and, and, and also their national versions. It has developed uh, general information material, provided technical assistance to countries and regions, and then capacity building. So um, the product registration system will be able to provide a platform to control how products are coming into the country for the case of Rwanda for example before products come into the country the vendor will have to apply indicate different parameters on that product before it's imported into the country when the product gets imported into the country it's now registered as the product um, that has been imported 
and uh, and at the customs they will check its compliance to to the requirements then the product will be let into the market but at any point the product can be traced back to the origin to when it was imported who imported it what were the parameters and actually be able to verify if the product complies and when you're talking about product registration system you're basically already indicating need for a label to be inserted on the product it's the only way that a product re registration system will be able to work because then you have a label against which you can be able to to indicate that the product is compliant or not compliant and um, the label also helps with uh, verification you know it has parameters on it and you can be able to tell real time that this product actually um, has these parameters and that's what is written there um, some of the parameters are not indicated on the product so it's easier for the label to actually be able to show you know if you're using a star rating for example show it's a five star and consumers can be able to read and say this is five star it's 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 it's, it's more efficient than three than four star and so it's a quick way to provide information to the uh, to the consumers but it's also a good way for for the uh, authorities to be able to control when products come into the country uh, without having a, a, a lot of experience and know-how on, on how to know whether the equipment is energy efficient or not this is very easy and visible to see and it works like i said with the product registration system because in some cases the product registration system actually is the one that issues the label the product is registered its parameters are inserted and the system will tell that this is you know five star four star or three star so um the label basically shores a visible mark you know a sticker that consumers can be able to see you know and they are supposed to be cross-cutting if you have a label that is being used for refrigeration for air conditioning for re refrigerators it's the same label that should basically be used for other appliances as well it becomes easier for people to be able to tell that this equipment is energy efficient or not because it's the same label that has been used across it also is it also becomes easier to do an awareness campaign because you are telling people about something they've already seen and they've already used in one way or another now u4e has implemented a couple of activities in different countries um, in different regions uh, i should just quick quickly give example a few national examples or regional examples that uh, u4e has conducted um, in in the area of energy efficiency and the work has actually revolved around conducting a market assessment uh, putting in place technical committees developing technical notes uh, on refrigerators and air conditioners uh, developing maps and labels and then providing technical assistance in the implementation uh, by subset countries for example the SADC um, region and the and, and the east african region and you can see a list of countries that are uh, that have been uh, receiving such kind kind of um, assistance and such kind of work these are both in the SADC and in the ESC region so to cite just a few examples I'll give an example of Rwanda where a market um, assessment was conducted 
Um, a national cooling strategy was drafted, uh, which indicates MAPs, labels, the financing mechanisms that we talked about, the, uh, the awareness campaign, and then a toolkit that will later on be used for capacity building in, in the ESC region. And some of the work that has been completed includes uh, the national cooling strategy that was uh, already adopted by the government of Rwanda and its implementation is underway. Uh, the financing mechanisms, coolies that I talked about was completed, on bill financing is underway. Then we talked about maps and labels that entered into force January this year, 2021. And then a communications campaign that is just concluding this month of March 2021. There's a couple of projects across Africa, in Ghana, in Senegal, um, and in, in the regions that I mentioned. But there's also some work in Nigeria that I will quickly talk about, uh, which included the market assessment for focused on SEs um, to review and strengthen maps and labels um, development and implementation of awareness campaign to promote compliance with vendors and labels to consumers inform the inclusion of uh, cooling targets in the NDCs update draft a space cooling chapter for the national cooling strategy action plan then deliver capacity building on market monitoring verification and enforcement and deliver the training itself on installation and service for there's a lot of work that is needed to go in on the communications and outreach all of that that i just mentioned including maps um, financial mechanisms, product registration system, labeling, need to be summed up by a communication and a good outreach. Because if all of that is done and, there's, and people do not know about it, enforcement becomes difficult and, and, um, and there's a lot of transformation that can naturally occur if people had information. So some of the main components in the communications com campaign include a communications campaign strategy, um, you know, then development of the content that will be used on different platforms, on social media, on radio, TV, in written news, news article, uh, and in some cases, uh, public shows and, uh, and road shows. Uh, but more importantly, the outreach and awareness campaign is actually most successful when it's done by the government agencies. A government agency is generally more trusted um, and it becomes holistic when a government agency that is talking about MEPS, that talks about financial mechanism, comes back to also do the awareness campaign and public sensitization. It becomes a whole holistic approach. And this is an example of some of the um, awareness campaign uh, slogan used in Rwanda for the, uh, for the awareness campaign that is just concluding that I mentioned about. Um, it's, uh, the campaign has been running for a certain period and it has included a lot of talk shows, a lot of debate, um, a lot of young people on social media, using social media influencers, and it has actually proved to be quite powerful. I've added a few slides here for your information on the, uh, on some of the material that U4E has. If you have time, please check the, the, the links below. You know, um, U4E has developed model regulations that each country can be able to plug in quickly. You know, by changing just a few things, it basically fits into most of the country's um, temperature being. 
so it can be adapted uh, with a few changes. It's what the government of Rwanda did. It was the first country to adopt the model regulations, and um, and for since January 2021, the implementation. Thank you very much. I would like now to give the floor to Agustin. So, Agustin, uh, you have the floor. Perfect. Thank you, Aris. Well, um, my name is Agustin Lorenzati. I work in the Argentine Network of Municipalities Against Climate Change, or as we call it, RAMCC. I work as a corporate carbon footprint analyst, but in this occasion, I will be presenting the Trust Fund. The RAMCC focuses on the aggregation of local projects into a sole high scale project, which allows to enhance economies of scale through reducing cost and risks. The first step towards aggregation of project, projects is to analyze the sustainable energy and climate action plans or SECAPs and group the measures that present similar goals or that are the, the same category such as, uh, for example, solar uh, energy or waste, waste management. And it is, it is important to mention that through this climate planning tool, Lancet local governments commit to reduce 45% of greenhouse gas emissions below the reference scenario by 2030 and become carbon neutral by 2050. Afterwards, a business model and a technical and legal assessments are developed, are developed sorry, to create one single project. To this respect, the RANCC has developed the RANCC Trust Fund, which is a building financial tool, a bundling financial tool, that allows uh, for the joint implementation of local projects, including included in the SECAPs. It is managed by local government and it is exclusively dedicated to climate action. It was created with a bottom-up approach by nine initial measures in 2018. And today it is formed by 23 municipalities. Through an ordinance uh, passed by the city council, majors sign a contract by means of which municipalities become trusters and beneficiaries of the funds. The decision making body of the trust fund is the majors council, which takes the key decisions and approve budget, internal policies, and adhesion of new members. The executive secretary of the RAMCC is responsible for obtaining resources and contributions for the third parties and for providing support to develop projects and programs. Lastly, um, the trust fund has a trustee which is the Banco Municipal de Rosario, which manages the available funds based on the decisions of the Major's Council and the Executive Secretary. The funds can be provided by the municipalities and or uh, by third parties. In this sense, um, a, collective, a first collective purchase of uh, 766 uh, LED lights for street lighting has been made by nine municipalities with own funds. Energy savings of the project add up to approximately um, 240 megawatt hour uh, per year, which results in a reduction of more than uh, 110 uh, tons of CO equivalent um, barrier emissions. On the other hand, the total investment 
uh, was approximately 135,000 US dollars, and the economic savings add up to uh, approximately 12,000 uh, dollars per year. The legal studies needed for the implementation were founded by the European Union, while the financial ones were supported by Ashoka through PES LATAM. Uh, well, as for the next steps, a second collective purchase of LED lights for street lighting is underway. 50% of LED lights have been mapped in the 118 in both municipalities and a total number of uh, 3,700 lights are expected to be replaced. After completing the, the mapping, uh, tenders will be organized and the collective purchases and the installations will be made. We also expect that transfer will be used in new sectors and more municipalities in this sense uh, during the 2021 uh, mayor's assembly of the trust fund majors agreed to buy uh, collectively solar panels and water heaters as well as electric vehicles and well this is the end of the presentations there's my email in case there there is any question that can be made now, and it's also the, the web of the network in case you want to, to take a look at our work. And thank you very much, and I, I'm available for the questions. Thank you very much, Agustin, for your presentation. Now, I, I would like now to initiate the Q&A. Agustin, uh, the first question that we received is, uh, what goals do you have for 2021? Well, for this year, we want to mobilize 150 million pesos, that will be uh, 1.5 million dollars through this trust fund. And we also want to optimize and, and strengthen the, the tool and also do capac capacitations and do do some work, internal work, to well, to strengthen the, the tool and op, yeah, optimize it. Thank you very much, Agustin. We still have one more question about you, and the question is, can any type of technology be acquired through the trust fund? Uh, yeah, uh, any type of technology, uh, most mostly related to renewable energy and energy efficiency can be purchased uh, this year we are moving forward with the acquisition of solar water heaters and solar panels, micro water meters with remote uh, management, electric mobility, and also LED lights. Thank you very much, Agustin. Uh, may I ask another question we received from the audience? Uh, and uh, I think it's for you. And the question is, is the LED project replacing the inefficient lighting system or is it a new project? Yeah, in most of cases, um, it's replacing an energy uh, system that is not working properly. But in other cases, um, the municipalities agreed on changing the lights, mostly because we, as, as a network, are working with the municipalities on uh, emission gases, greenhouse gases emissions inventories. And this is like an, an action to not also have a, a most efficient energy system, but also to reduce emissions. So many, many municipalities um, take this, this action also for reducing contamination. Yeah. Thank you very much, Agustin. Uh, it seems that uh, we don't have any other questions. Yeah, now I would like to give the floor for the closure to my colleague, uh, Jorge. Jorge? 
Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Aris, for the coordination. Uh, <clears throat> good morning to everyone. My name is Jorge Rogat, and I think we met uh, the very first day of this, uh, this uh, training course. I would like to thank uh, Agustin for his presentation, especially because I guess he was forced to wake up very early, very early this morning because of the uh, time difference between Europe and, and Latin America, which I think I think they are lying behind five hours or something. So thank you very much, Agustin, for waking up that early. The presentation given by, by Agustin uh, also is an illustration of a project bundling that I presented, if you remember, the second day of this uh, training course. Uh, and it shows the benefits of, of implementing project bundling or doing project bundling uh, because of all the economies of scales that you can gain from, from using this, this met methodology. And, and we know this has been applied successfully in, in Argentina uh, by municipalities for street lighting. So that just reinforced that uh, we are suggesting about project bundling is fully, fully feasible. Since this is the closure, I won't be that long. Uh, we have come to the last day of this training, composed of six modules covering different issues uh, in the energy efficiency area. Today, uh, you had uh, or you heard about the uh, MRB, uh, the last component of content of this training course, uh, since the last two uh, presentations were supposed to be experiential. So uh, we have reached the, the end of this five-day training course, composed of six different modules. I hope we have achieved the main objective of the training, which was or has been to share knowledge and key learnings to foster energy efficiency, the regional, local, and national level, and with a special focus uh, on East African cities and, and municipalities. We really hope we have uh, achieved this, uh, this uh, objective and I really hope that you have enjoyed the training course along these this, uh, five days. I would like to thank all the panelists for their presentations. I would like to thank you all participants for joining us and for being with us all the time. We have had, I have to say, a very high <coughs> participation rate in this training. We have been given a number of training in other regions of the world. And uh, I think we, this is one of the highest participation rates we have had uh, in this training. With that, I would like to say goodbye. And uh, once again, all the material will be available from the presentations, will be available online on our website. So Aris, I don't have much more to say uh, from my end. So. That's it. And once again, thank you to everyone. And I, I really hope you have enjoyed this training and that you have found this training useful for, for your work. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Uh,